กาแห้งผมเอาผลิตภัณฑ์หนึ่งของอเมริกาเขาทำที่บอกนี่โปรตีนหนึ่งหยดฆ่าหนูได้ที่ความเข้มข้นเท่าไหร่ครับไม่ต้องถาม Why do we have to keep our mouths shut just because we think differently? Maybe this is why. Can I choose my way? Hello, welcome back to day two of CAFRA. Nicotine is not the enemy, is the subject, and I'm going to introduce the panelists one by one. First, we have Dr. Shri. Shri, you're muted and your camera is off, so if you could turn the camera on and unmute, that would be great. There she is. Oh. Hi, Shri. Uh, hi, Nancy. <laughs> Let me get everyone else in. Um, we have Asa Salagupta. Hi, Ace. Hello. Hey. Uh, and we'll add Liana. Liana, hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> okay. So you guys saw the film. Actually, we finished off with your film, Asa, which is excellent and epic, and everybody loves it. Um, and Shri is in India. I'm going to call you Shri and not Dr. Shri. Is that okay? Completely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about nicotine. Um, one of the things that has come out and that has been discussed previously is how, you know, the WHO, FCTC, and Bloomberg have done this pivot from being against tobacco per se now to nicotine. Now, in India, I want to start with Shri. In India, you guys have a ban, um, and I know that you have done studies on harm reduction and how it helps people. So can you brief, give us a brief situation update on the work that you do and what is going on in India, Shri? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity and represent about the harm reduction efforts we are undertaking in India. As you highlighted, the government of India has banned uh, electronic nicotine delivery system products in India. So effectively, uh, the tobacco consumers cannot uh, utilize those products in the sense personal consumption is not bad, right? Importing, uh, sales, manufacturing, advertising, those components have been banned legally, but personal consumption has not been banned. So that is the status as of now. And coming to the uh, components of harm reduction efforts, as a public health researcher, I have been focusing for the past five years in tobacco. I have been focusing especially on low income group populations. My work started in uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems related research when WHO has conducted this union conference in 50th edition of the union conference in Hyderabad. That is when, when I was going through this uh, conference themes, there was a theme on this alternative reduced risk alternative products for tobacco and electronic nicotine delivery systems was one of the listed theme for conference. And I chose to do research on this topic. That is when I thought like I will understand how Indian tobacco consumers are actually using this electronic nicotine delivery system product as an alternative to reduce the tobacco harms. That is when I designed a survey, a research survey to interact with these consumers to understand how and why, for what purpose they are using and what change this particular uh, product is making a difference in their uh, life when it is related to this reduced risk alternative perspective. At that point, when I was scanning the landscape of this consumer, uh, organizations involved in this uh, reduced risk alternative, I came across 
Association for Vapors, uh, that is AVI. And I reached out to Mr. Samrat Chaudhary uh, to help me conduct this, roll out this survey and reach out to this uh, consumers using this electronic nicotine delivery system. This is way back in April of the 50th edition of uh, Union Conference. That is when I started this tobacco harm reduction related research in India. Unfortunately, you will not believe this. As a researcher, I have undertaken varieties of research topics. No one stopped me saying, you cannot do this research. But for the first time in my entire 10 plus years, as a public health researcher, this is the first topic my institutional ethics committee has not given me ethics approval to undertake this survey. And it is indefinitely held up in our ethics committee because mm -hmm. the moment I submitted this proposal for ethics committee review, the government of India has banned all those components, but not research. In spite of that, the ethics committee withheld the ethics approval and the study has been pending. So that is the research related to electronic nicotine delivery system in spite of the fact that consumers have been using that product till the ban and the ban did not allow the banning of research on that particular product. Why did the ban happen? Because for various reasons, the ban happened. But till that point of time, the consumers have been using the product. As a researcher, my only point of interest is to document why the product has been adopted, what changes happen or not happen. That is the purpose of research, right? Yeah. And for the first time that happened, and that actually kick-started me to understand what are, what is the background of entire harm reduction related to tobacco because I come from HIV background. I am not just MBBS, MD community medicine. I have done one year CDC funded HIV fellowship and the entire HIV fellowship is based on harm reduction, whether it is condom promotion or when, I, when we work with high risk group communities like drug users, intravenous drug abusers or LGBT community, we predominantly base our HIV HIV prevention programs on harm reduction approaches. I have, after my HIV fellowship, I went ahead and did my Asian harm reduction and drug policy fellowship from Open Society Foundation. My entire career is predominantly driven by harm reduction approach. And this is the first time I'm facing such a uh, mind numbing, brain fog kind of uh, unbelievable career block when it comes to tobacco harm reduction. That has driven me to understand what are all these dynamics in this tobacco harm reduction? And the past five years have uh, unraveled very many dimensions, whether it is uh, consumer perspectives, whether it is policy perspectives, whether it is a human rights approach. I have been listening to your uh, yesterday's uh, streaming of the events, whether it's human rights approach or your previous video, the very many 360 degree approach to this tobacco. Well, um, we've lost Shree. The low and middle She's coming middle. back. There is a cyclone warning in Chennai, yeah. so we may lose her for good. But no, there you she is. Back. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sorry for that interruption. So it's coming okay. back to my research. So I predominantly, because there are a lot of groups working on tobacco harm reduction, highlighting all the perspectives you showcased in your video. But my work is predominantly based in the public health in the sense like we are the community people, we are in the grassroots. So my work is only focusing, I, I'll speak only about my work, which is focused on the low and middle income group uh, population that is migrants. In India, the interstate migration is phenomenally escalated in the last 10 years. And I am in the South India, which is like one of the metro cities that is Chennai city, South Indian capital. And uh, we have seen such a phenomenal growth in interstate migration from North India, North Central and East India. And these are predominantly low income group population, illiterate, even my study reveals, I cannot believe the data, 65% people are still illiterate in the sense like they have never stepped into a school. Okay, even now, and they, they are predominantly tobacco chewers. 
So when you talk about tobacco harm reduction and electronic nicotine delivery system, I see the disconnect, the zarring disconnect of this low income group people having no access to such tools. So when you literally talk about tobacco harm reduction from that low income group perspective, for me, the basic tobacco harm reduction tool is information. Where is that information for these folks? These people are totally not having access to the basic harm reduction information as the major tool. Then my other group of uh, focus is women, because when I'm talking to these people, I felt like the woman, the gender lens is totally missing in tobacco. And the tobacco harm reduction is not focusing the gender lens, the predominant messages in tobacco control. Whenever they show a smoking, the man comes, he will smoke a cigarette. You talk about cancer, the lung cancer. November month is lung cancer awareness month. Entire the gender angle is on men, tobacco, smoking. The women are totally missing out in a conservative society like India. Women smoking is a taboo right yeah. so i followed up my migrant uh, research with women and tobacco and taboo in a society and especially in south indian society with so much of taboo and conservatism and that is my second uh, research topic and tobacco harm reduction the third the third year i followed up with my research again on one of the most discriminated vulnerable population lgbtq especially focusing on transgender women mm -hmm. so yeah. to summarize i don't want to take other panelists time to summarize, my tobacco harm reduction research in India wanted to bring out the narratives of this missed out population, the hidden pockets of tobacco harm reduction, where the harm reduction tool is, we are talking about first tool is information. Okay, access mm -hmm. to information about the tobacco harms, especially the chewable forms of tobacco, because these are discretionary practices. They are not mm -hmm. even able to afford a smoking product like cigarette because it is beyond their means. The BDs, the smokeless tobacco products, widely available, though on paper, Gutka, Kaini, Panparag, the most affordable, cheapest options banned, but widely available. Recent paper also that tobacco control scientists have unearthed that these products, though banned on paper, are widely available. So coming back to your question, the harm reduction potential in India is huge. Next only to China, the burden is almost 300 million tobacco users, of which 200 plus millions are chewers. The harm reduction potential is so much. Going back to your uh, earlier question, uh, being a woman scientist, especially in India, talking about harm reduction, I find a lot of women scientists, women doctors are evangelists for tobacco harm reduction more than male colleagues and male scientists and male doctors. And we need to highlight this point. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because Liana and I, and I've also had this discussion with Lindsay Stroud about women advocates versus men advocates. Nothing against you, Asa. Sorry, you're stuck in a room full of women. But um, it's that, you know, women seem to understand a certain level of, of, of care, I guess. They're more in tune to that, to other people and the harm. Um, you, you said something that was interesting, and I want to formulate a question for you. Your research has been on migrants and women and people of the lower socioeconomic strata and their use of tobacco or nicotine. So we're talking about nicotine today. So my question for you is, do you believe that, the, that all of the people that do use these products in India, is it a manner of self-medication? Because I know for me that, you know, nicotine helps calm me and it helps me focus. So how does that work when translating over to the products that are available in India? Exactly. When I talk to you, the migrants, they are, uh, what do you say? They are uh, away from the social protective net. That is, they are away from their families. They are away from their culture. They are away from their known uh, friends and peers. So a North Indian, suppose, say, from Orissa, Bengal, these are like extreme cultural variations. They are uprooting themselves from their culture. And they are bringing to extremely different culture like South Indian culture, the food habits, the living habits, the, uh, the kind of uh, entertainment factors, totally different. So they are uprooting themselves and coming to a different locality, different culture in search of livelihood. Such extreme disruption, the only solace they find is in these kind of products like nicotine and alcohol. So 
the kind of uh, poverty which propels them to uproot themselves they ask me directly madam i have only this nicotine to give me solace and once in a week i go and buy alcohol so why do you want to take away this nicotine away from me why do you want mm -hmm. me even to consider quitting okay you say harm reduction instead of uh, taking 10 bds or 10 kni pouches or quits you want me to reduce the harms by minimizing it to 5 or 6 i will do that but completely quitting it is out of my consideration never ask me to do that so to come back to the question is it for solace is it for recreation is it for that kind of use it is definitely that because everyone knows about the harms of smoking everyone knows that consuming tobacco is going to kill them with cancer tobacco use causes mm -hmm. cancer everyone is aware 99% awareness is there the pictorial warning labels are educating them the repeated messages in television mass media is educating them but in spite of that why are they using that because this uprooting especially when it comes to migrants women women they are not at all uh, given importance in the families they are their secondary role they are uh, bored at home once husband and children go away so all these dynamics are clearly revealed in our research that is by the role the function the nicotine use or tobacco product use is being played in the life of migrants and women is clearly documented in our research yeah yeah asa i'm not ignoring you liana asa oh. does that also translate into thailand because i know a lot of the situation is similar between india and thailand very very similar very much it's uh oh uh i look i look at india and and uh saw a lot of uh, similarities between the two of us you know the ban but uh, ban on on importation on possession and also uh with the people getting arrested for uh, doing something that is safer and actually it's not illegal you know possession and the act of vaping itself is not illegal here in thailand but people still got arrested just because uh, some officials use that loophole and some like uh, wording of the law itself and saying that since it's it's banned to import and it's illegal to manufacture and distribute then you cannot uh, you cannot sorry you you cannot Anyways. possess you cannot own and you cannot wear which is a different story altogether so yeah. it's it's really it's it's a crazy situation going on here in thailand so yeah. it's very similar to what happened in india also and uh, also with the uh, three being a female researchers i i don't no if we have such here in thailand there are a, uh, there are female uh doctors who call themselves researchers and uh about electronic cigarettes one similar thing is that uh if you do something you do researches on electronic cigarette or vaporizers or vaping itself uh it's it's you know people will go and say like hey you cannot do that right away and and uh, they they will say like hey you can't do it because it's illegal how are you going to do it you know they they just don't list uh, they don't pay attention to saying seeing that uh, the product itself is already in the market although it's a black market but it is still in the market we are, we have millions of vapors so yeah, the market is there and uh, the product itself is readily available anywhere i mean not as much as a regular cigarette so you know okay so doing researches on something like that and uh, being banned and uh, so I, i i don't think it's fair and we had seen i had last week i was in the meeting at the parliament and uh, there were there was a research from uh questionable resources uh, mm -hmm. they said the 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 researchers said that 
to begin the, to giving out the speeches on the research, they have to declare conflict of interest and uh, the people paying to do the research was tobacco control Thailand. And so, you know, the their main aim is to ban electronic cigarettes. So that that's that's their agenda and that's their main point. So, you know, and, and the rest is all uh, just figures assuming that electronic cigarette is more harmful than cigarettes itself. That's now, what the picture is based on. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a, there, I know there's a black market in Thailand for e-cigarettes, and I believe there's one in India as well. Do you have any information on that, Sri? Yeah. In uh, newspaper articles, uh, we keep continuously reading how the ban is not really helping this non-availability of these products. Even in the recent times, uh, an article has highlighted how on online these products are available. And even in a, a black market, because of this ban, there is no regulation and it is more harmful because of this ban yeah. in the black market, what kind of products are available, who is buying it, and if it is an uneducated person because it is in the black market, all these uh, practices will be more harmful. Right. Yeah. There are news articles highlighting this particular issue, especially even uh, we uh, we are aware of uh, certain economics background professors highlighting the importance of reconsidering or having a debate how the ban has actually uh, advanced to the cost on whatever reasons the government has proposed it. It is the time for us to call for a debate. Even recently, one of our medical oral medicine uh, specialists, she a female uh, doctor again highlighted the importance of reconsidering whether is it a crime in the larger vision of the public health goals even if, whether it is she questioned i'm just re uh, paraphrasing her words from the article whether it is a crime in the bigger vision of achieving the public health goals this ban has to be reconsidered call for a multi-stakeholder discussion what are the merits of this ban demerits of the ban in the wake of the newer emerging evidence whether we have to regulate it rather go for a ban. Yeah, I mean, I did receive um, notification for the COP9. There was a bulletin. I shared it with you guys in private chat. Um, and just for the audience, in case you haven't read it and haven't seen it, um, there is not supposed to be any discussion at this particular COP meeting with regards to decisions being made about safer nicotine products. However, there have been the usual expected shenanigans with awards being awarded to countries that support the, the status quo and the Ash, dirty ashtray award to the Philippines for supporting the EU and the UK for harm reduction. So the point of what I'm trying to get to here is that it's very interesting, you know, that people are now beginning to countries as well, are beginning to question the experts and the science that they're being told about what is going on. In the bulletin, and I don't know if anybody read it, but in the bulletin, you know, there's a lot of frustration there because people aren't playing the game. Uh, I'm going to ask Liana because she's going, and you haven't spoken yet. Tell us, Liana, what was your take on that? Oh, my gosh. From my consumer viewpoint, what I see is that they are not getting along with another. Um, the parties cannot reach any kind of agreement on anything. They're really fighting to, what does it say specifically here? To addressing the contents of the agenda. Um, it says the draft decision is reasonable and reflects a path to, to, for moving forward with the critical work of the COP. So they're, they're not getting along. They definitely aren't. Um, and how it's causing delays. And of course, their biggest concerns seem to be about money, bottom line. Yeah. Okay. That's what it seems to be about. And can I say something? Of course I you wanted can. To, uh, Shri, thank you so much for your study. I just want to say as a consumer, um, listening to what you were talking about and um, the particular pockets of study that you had, I came from one of those pockets. I just want you to know that. And I'm a female. And I had a very, very, very wrecked, tragic life 15 years ago. I did not have all this. And um, I, I smoked like it was just going out of style. 
okay, all the time. It was a fix. It, and you don't care about your health. You're surviving at that point. And that's all that matters. And the nicotine was just like, it was just a, a something. It was just something to like fixate on. It was, it was more than just some casual addiction. And it was a part of it. And as you get healthier and you get more well off and you, you know, you get through school, you start becoming concerned about your health. You start realizing, oh, you know, your body's suffering because you're paying attention to it instead of other things. And then you care and you try to quit and you try, you know, gum upsets my stomach and patches burn my skin and they don't work. And I miss the hand mouth fixation. And I realize that I have some mental things with my focus and that nicotine is something I always reverted back to always. And I just want you to know that I really appreciate what you're doing because I have been studying since I came into um, developing um, just a couple years ago. I've been studying what's been going on in India and, and, it's, and it's just like so huge. And, and when, when the ban hit and all that became illegal, like it just broke my heart. And then watching it happen in other countries does. I just wanted to tell you thank you for, for your study, and I do hope that you're able to get your survey out there, and you let me know, because I definitely want to take part in it, because, you know, because of vaping, chronic bronchitis is gone, asthma is gone, no inhaler, clear lungs within six months by proof of an x-ray. So everybody's work here is important, very, very important. I want everybody to know that. Um, this cop thing, though, obviously they can't work together and we're working together from all over the world. Okay, we have unity. We know the truth and it's like plain and simple for us. They're having a hard time because they're working on a bunch of BS. Pardon that, but it's all it is. It's a bunch of lies and how can we fabricate it and put it under the guise that we're doing something for the good of the people. They're doing good for their own pockets and keeping people sick, keeping people limited while they control the nicotine. And if they can keep people sick, they put money in the pockets of pharma and everybody can make money off of taxes in their, whatever they're at by taxing. That's a sin tax. You know, show me that done to caffeine and let's watch the riot begin. Okay. Well, Cause it's the same. Here's another thing. I mean, and it's not nicotine related, but for example, you know, we all know the harms of excessive alcohol use, but no, for the most part, culturally, okay, having a beer or having a glass of wine is not a problem. How come that doesn't translate over to nicotine? What is the big difference? You see, you know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah, I know that because they, on the alcohol as well. Um, I do have a question though for Shri, um, or I'm going to, I have a statement and then I'm going to ask Shri another question. India's statement at the COP9, the health secretary is talking only about India's COVID response and hasn't said anything about the ban of vape. Do you think this is a good sign? And do you think this is a progress perhaps? Because, yeah, that's the first question. <laughs> Thank you for the first question directed towards uh, India, because definitely India is a big player when it comes to reducing the tobacco related uh, health issues or tobacco related diseases. Uh, we also had conducted one or two uh, webinars, especially when there was a change at the level of uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare and there was a lot of hope and uh, interest whether there was going to be some uh, significant changes coming towards uh, tobacco policies and we invited multidisciplinary guests from uh, uh, economics background who understand all these things and we were tracking certain uh, news articles from esteemed uh, journalists who are keeping track of tobacco harm reduction and they were attending global conferences from London, from Europe and everywhere and they were writing a series of articles in the uh, national media and uh, we were thinking like maybe the time has come maybe the needle is going to shift and when we invited the guests and asked them sir or madam is this the time we can expect certain positive changes in the, the direction of national tobacco control policy they were hopeful but realistically they put us in our place and said like in the middle of the pandemic that is what exactly the question is asking that is why i'm telling this background 
to prepare you telling that in the middle of the pandemic please be practical this is india you cannot expect any non covid related policy measures taking a priority on the minds of the ministers whether it's prime minister or health minister mm -hmm. so be prepared that it will take time keep keep the uh, uh, work or momentum of your work going keep talking keep writing keep uh, uh, discussing with the experts about the importance of tobacco harm reduction one fine day when all this work accumulates this will drive them towards the change but right now in the middle of the pandemic the priority will be pandemic in a country with one nearing 1.4 billion people yeah, so that yeah. is what is reflected in the same statement of the health minister related to this particular question okay with re with regards to research okay what is the sense among Indian academics in general regarding interference into scientific research? Are academics okay with the ban or the, the, the limit on the tobacco and nicotine research? Or is it seen as an attack on the integrity of the scientific method? This is an extremely important question for me, at least because I'm in the academia and I undertake tobacco related research regularly. But unfortunately, uh, I see like the most of the research uh, being generated from India is focused 99% still on tobacco control. If I undertake a project just to fulfill this question's answer, uh, like if I engage in a real academic rigor and say like, what is the kind of research coming out? Everyone is doing the routine research in the sense they are understanding the problem burden, which is already established. There is no questions about what is the problem burden. So it is heavily, heavily, heavily identifying the burden and proposing solutions. No one is undertaking any kind of research to solve that solution in the direction of tobacco harm reduction. Okay, so I'm sorry to admit that the research coming out of India is not novel in the sense like it is addressing the question of tobacco harm reduction per se. And coming to that particular point when this ban came in, and when uh, there is an interference of uh, scientists being directed to do this kind of research or that kind of research only, there is not much opposition, unlike in humanities, when the, there was a shift in certain uh, funding. Suppose a government funding was given earlier to do research in humanities, but now they are telling with this funding, you can do only this research that research there was a hue and cry and people resigned the senior most professors esteemed professors distinguished professors have resigned telling that this is interfering with my freedom this is interfering mm -hmm. with my scholarly freedom they resigned but i did not hear such thing happening in medical field it did not happen especially to this question so it did not happen it will not happen because 99 percent the funding is going to tobacco control based research and people are comfortable in doing that kind of research because tobacco harm reduction has no big takers in India because they know they know nothing because my own research re revealed that 90% of my qualitative study revealed medical professionals except for psychiatry professionals are not aware of this tobacco harm reduction science. Okay. And the second thing when they are not aware of the tobacco harm reduction science, what kind of tobacco harm reduction research they will yeah. undertake? And why will they think that this is an interference? Yeah, exactly. It, it absolutely makes no sense. I mean, what is a, a question from one of the audience from um, Patrick? I guess whoever wants to answer this can answer this, but let's all three of us, all three of you answer it at one at a time. What are your thoughts that the, the WHO FCTC announced that they are tabling any tobacco harm reduction discussion until the next COP? Let's start with Asa. Asa, what is your thought on that? Really? Uh, what, what, <clears throat> one of the things that happened here in Thailand is it doesn't matter what uh, the WHO FCTC or whoever uh, mentioned anything but they will twist uh, twist the wordings and select only what is suitable for themselves and post that as a must. Uh, it had happened in the past saying, you know, like uh, WHO insisted that Thailand must, according to the pact and uh, the, the signatories and things like that, 
we have to ban electronic cigarette we have to do this we have to do that uh, according and they always say like according to article 5.3 and another thing that i really want to mention here is that um uh, in in the bulletin coming out they were saying about uh big tobacco's tactics and uh they are kind of in a roundabout way saying that we uh, consumer groups are part of big tobacco and i have been i had I have been blamed that and uh, there's a letter going to the parliament saying that with me sitting on a seat with the uh, subcommittees to consider to lift the ban on electronic cigarette is not right uh, it's a violation of uh, article 5.3 of uh, the who fctc cop and uh, saying that you know, like I, uh, I, I, I'm, I will probably be going to a court real soon, because uh, one of the uh, professor, doctor, something I don't even care to remember her name, but said that uh, since I am an employee of a certain tobacco uh, company, one of the big tobaccos then I shouldn't be sitting with the subcommittee. So they, they are calling me right from, from, uh, from if you remember, like last year or something, uh, Stanton Clans and Ren Rudy had posted uh, in a journal saying that uh, I had ties with Big Tobacco. And now they are calling me, they are saying that I, I am an employee. I work for Big Tobaccos. <sighs> So, you know, it doesn't matter what, what COP had decided, COP9 had decided to postpone. What is going to happen in Thailand is all these doctors are going to twist all the wordings and, and say something that is uh, beneficial to them. So, you know, like, of course, you know, and, and, and with the bulletins uh, pointing out the tactics of uh, big tobaccos that will... No, I, I don't think it will look good in Thailand. Um, Liana, I know that the United States hasn't ratified, but what are your, what's your take? Unmute, darling. Okay, so all the states are in different stories. Um, to that question that was asked, um, tabling tobacco harm reduction discussions until the next COP, I would love to think that they were taking the time to actually gather more truthful information, but I have to agree with Asa on this point that they are going to pick and choose what they need to, to win their point of view, to, to get mm -hmm. to, their, to their decisions on everything. But like I said, I would love to think that it was because they were gonna wait until more truth was come out. But that's really all I have to say about that. I just get so really it's mad. okay no it's cool we had a comment i want to throw this one at, at, at shree um i'm gonna find it hold on i just saw it using covid to justify tobacco harm reduction or the denial of tobacco harm reduction do you feel that that's exactly what's going on in, in india india is a complex country nancy all of you are aware right uh, the priorities in a country like india with uh, so many other uh, uh, problems parallelly happening alongside COVID, it is difficult for a non-Indian uh, to understand if the question is coming from a non-Indian, if I, I believe like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for example, only yesterday, I read a report about malnutrition in children less than five years. 42% of children less than uh, five years are found to be malnourished, of which 31 are severely malnourished. So. Yeah. Those reports are also coming on a daily basis. So it, for a person, when we are debating on this topic alone, this looks like a highly important topic, tobacco harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, November is a lung uh, cancer awareness week. And we are talking about 30% reduction of tobacco smoking by 2030. We are already in 2021. And 25% yeah. uh, reduction to have been achieved of non-communicable disease mortality by 2025. We have so many mm -hmm. targets already in national health policy. And uh, every day we see so many disheartening reports, especially malnutrition, maternal child health, tuberculosis, and 
covid has actually opened up a different scenario in india because no, all other non covid related health services have been relegated to a uh, back uh, back uh, list hiv mm -hmm. services disrupted cancer services disrupted tuberculosis people were telling hiv care has gone to uh, pre h uh, heart that is hiv highly active antiretroviral therapy kind of scenario so when you see those kind of reports as a public health academician and a public health professor in a academia for me to give a straight answer it it is mm -hmm. very tricky i can I definitely argue tobacco harm reduction being on this panel is equally important yeah. but coming from that perspective in a country with 1.4 billion aspirations balancing all this perspective sitting in the ministry might also be very difficult so yeah no. uh, so so i definitely want to advocate for tobacco harm reduction being on this panel and i want to present the case of all this especially vulnerable population groups especially the demand for access improving access for information and tobacco cessation services in the government setting because that is where it will be a game changer for these people because awareness creation for tobacco cessation is going to be the major major hurdle we have to cross because in one of the reports shared by one of the esteemed colleagues they said that in spite of implementing uh, who fctc in the past of, uh, 10 years for a decade implementing all the five uh, demand reduction measures such as taxation smoke so smoke free policies pictorial warning labels advertising mm -hmm. bans and cessation programs in the fctc uh, implementing countries there is only marginal improvement of 1% so that is not at all going to help us any of this population level public health goals so to yeah. improve those things in low and middle income countries of which 17 countries are there in that list of 116 countries i represent lmic so for me the priority is to demand the who tobacco cessation consortium to establish similar to uh, sustainable development goals 2030 similar to that framework this tobacco cessation consortium should have specific year marked goals for low and middle income countries in establishing yeah. uh smoking cessation centers and improving the access for this uh, smoking cessation tools along with education and harm reduction what is it harm reduction approach for tobacco chewing products and tobacco uh, smoking products in the name if not the products if they want to table this till next cop are the people not going to die because of already using this yeah. tobacco products yeah. are they going yeah. to wait till next cop are you going to halt this death till next cop so what are the interim plans till next cop to improve these services or improve access to these services improving affordability to these services at least they can reveal those plans What do you think the lessons that we as advocates can learn from the way the WHO and governments are addressing the COVID pandemic and translating that over to the tobacco pandemic? So I I seriously understand uh, the analogy is very similar the pandemic is now uh, all over the world the tobacco pandemic and the one thing the pandemic especially revealed in this context as the great reshuffle the reshuffle of ideas i'm extremely disappointed when the cop 9 has shut down this space for inviting the multiple stakeholders whereas the uh, corona pandemic opened the doors for everyone to come together to pool their resources of intellectual competencies resources from zuckerberg gates everyone pooled their money and the vaccines happened in a year right mm -hmm. but yeah. cop cop 9 is shutting doors to all these opportunities by involving in one of the blog written by an esteemed uh, uh, professional colleague of ours he invoked the principle of exclusivity whereas entire world is going to inclusion and diversity cop 9 is unique that it excluded everyone else except those few people they wanted to so why is that is there no platform to raise uh, issue about this so no, no. the the only uh, uh, difference between the corona pandemic and tobacco pandemic cop 9 is where in corona pandemic you invited everyone to pool their entire resources 
here you are excluding the real people who are affected to pool in their problems to pool in their ideas to find a solution it's yeah. not about one tool called ends it's not about one tool or one product mm. it is about identifying multiple solutions for multiple people this is about inclusivity and diversity yeah no i mean harm reduction has to be a holistic thing it has to be inclusive it has to include all of the different facets that cause harm okay because conceivably you know tobacco use can just be merely one symptom of something bigger that's going on so they have to understand that the, the, it's a network think of it like you know dots here and they all connect um, within within one year of pandemic you have at least 171 plus candidate vaccines being in trials across the globe what yeah. about this harm reduction potential and what is the spectrum of products that can fit into this right i mean they're already there so yes so you know but again and i'm going to use leona's favorite thing it's this it's money you know sure. and it and you know it just it boggles my mind especially you know an organization such as the who which is under the un which you know should be about people and really it's gotten so off track as everyone has been saying it's not about you know the health of the public it's about the special interests you know and it's gotten that corrupted and using covid to justify those narrow you know viewpoints it's appalling it's actually it, you know colin said last night it's a social justice issue and i think it really it truly is asa yep it is it's it's the 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 exclusivity that uh, one of the thing i would like to point out is that uh, if you have heard, i think it was yesterday wasn't it that uh, the issues kept came out from cop 9 saying mm -hmm. how parallel they want to I, th I think it was like an issue from clive base or some was it from from the, from our email like yesterday and yeah. uh, they want to compare themselves to cop 26 which is about uh, the environmental health issue, environmental issue, not health. And uh, the COP9, the FCTC COP9 wants to run a parallel, uh, like saying how alike they're trying to say that there are two big events going on at the same time. And uh, if if we want to compare it, we, we can see that COP26 uh, about uh, the environmental issues are being broadcast, uh, being broadcasted all over the places. It's very transparent and uh, the parties involved and invited, or at least, you know, you can sit in and be uh, observers. Uh, most, most parties are welcome, you know, like yeah, they have all sense. stakeholders. Yeah, they have all stakeholders mm -hmm. there present, but not not the cop the fctc cop you know you have to agree with them and you have to sign shitload of papers and, and <laughs> yeah. you have to well that's why i and, find it really interesting that you know in that last bulletin i know i'm interrupting you i'm sorry in that last bulletin that you know they're, they're kind of getting chastised for being naughty for not going along with the plan and i see that as a good thing because that means maybe it is starting to change mm -hmm. Because they are, they're diametrically opposed. I mean, one is inclusive and let's all talk about this and they, you know, let the gas companies in and the oil companies in, mm -hmm. you know. And then meanwhile, you know, in order to, to exclude us as consumers, they just automatically tag us all as tobacco company. Oh, sorry, for 5.3. Well, that doesn't even apply to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand. And there's no justification for them to actually use that to exclude us. But here we are. I'm just a bot, remember? I'm not a big <laughs> tobacco. I am a bot. You're a bot. Remember that. Yeah, I'm just a um, bot on Twitter and social media. <laughs> we do have a question. Um, what is the hardest thing for governments to understand about vaping and other THR methods? Shri? I will speak from an Indian perspective because uh, uh, compared to the other uh, Mm, uh, policy makers across the world, uh, it looks like uh, we need to sensitize our policy makers about the tobacco harm reduction science because 
listening to some of the earlier panels where I have heard from a consumer organization representatives mentioning that in the parliament when uh, this debate was happening around this um, uh, discussions and debates were happening, it looked like our policy makers were not updated about the tobacco harm reduction science and uh, the potential or the components. So it, it looks like we need to have certain sensitization and more frequent discussions with them. But unfortunately, as the scenario or the environment is right now, we don't have opportunities to do that. That is one of the reason uh, uh, consumer organizations and activism is happening to conduct more and more sessions. But sometimes we need to uh, seek out more opportunities to go and meet them, uh, send out some kind of uh, easy to read, easy to understand uh, uh, scientific nuggets. That is one thing I think we need to do, especially in India, because uh, they are not uh, very much aware of this tobacco harm reduction science, Nancy. OK, thank you for that, Sri. Asa? Uh, sorry, I was uh, yeah, I, I was trying to answer the comment from the people. Uh, th there's one comment saying why more tobacco companies are not adv advocating the entry into new market of vaping when they can sell their products at uh, in a high market. And Nancy, if you remember that, uh, like three or four years back, mm -hmm. where we met in Japan and we have representative of one of the very big. Uh, tobacco yes. company coming out and uh, some rat our dear friend had asked that exact same question and remember mm -hmm. they said like they have their reputations yeah to I remember uh, that to uphold. <laughs> and do you remember when I turned around to them and I said to them um yeah but see you got to understand that you what you're calling vaping isn't vaping according to what we do and we're worried that mm -hmm. one's gonna take over and that happened too didn't it Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? exactly. And uh, going back to the questions uh, that uh, had been asked, uh, like, uh, what was it like uh, the comparing to tobacco with the pandemic, right? Yeah, the lessons to be learned and responses. Uh, we had, we had, you know, like, uh, I don't want to name names here, but uh, we had uh, we had seen lots of failures from uh, the WHO itself since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And uh, I, I don't know what people are still going like they are so high, holy and mighty. You mm -hmm. know, there are people working in groups in together and uh, people tend to make mistakes to err is human. They are, they are also human. So I don't get it why like you know, if if uh, if they had okay in the beginning of uh, vaping of our journey uh, twenty years ago, fifteen twenty years ago, yeah. Yeah. and uh, they they don't understand, and it's been called electronic cigarettes. So okay, they they will probably think and they see the big fume coming out, the big vapor coming out, and they were afraid. I could understand, but now with lots and lots of scientific researchers and 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 all the papers coming out i mean it's it wouldn't it be easy to just like for us human you know for me for example personally if i did something wrong or i made a mistake you know i i, I smoked for 38 years and i just turn around and say hey i was wrong and mm -hmm. let's do this instead but you know with their high and mighty stances they say once they uh commit to something yeah they're uh, dogged about it yeah and so you know it's their egos working on the, like uh on high on on full level you know on right. a human level i think it's fear I think oh, they've yeah, been definitely. doing the same thing for so long in the same way that any kind of change just scares them. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's an impact on their ego. It's also an impact on their relevance. And I think with some of them who are maybe mid-career, it's an impact on their financial future. So we've got oh, yeah. people that are operating out of fear. And, you know, humans that operate out of fear are the most dangerous humans there are. Mm. You know? All right. This is your chance. Right now, this is your number one chance to say what you would like to say to the COP9 delegates. 
I will start with you, Liana, and then we will trend, go through everybody else. Liana, what would you like to say to them? Let us in. You have to end the exclusivity. Everybody needs to be heard. Not just the people that are trying to make laws and that have money, but the ones that the laws are actually affecting. That's pretty much it. Okay, cool. Asa? Uh, you represent people. You say, and, and you, you said, and you are saying that uh, you are working for public health. The word public health means the health of the public in general. And uh, you are representing uh, for Thailand 70 something million people. We have over 10 million smokers. And so please represent us by listening to us. Uh, we are calling out and we are giving you the scientific researchers and uh, for the delegates to uh, COP9, especially for Thai delegate, when you say something, please uh, be, what's the word? Uh, uh, what's, what's the exact wording? Just make sure people understand what you're trying to say and be uh, aha. clear. I'm, I'm lost. Uh, li literate, right? Literate. Yeah, literate. Yeah. Yeah, and something like uh, yeah, and and well, on a personal note, remove your mask. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shri. Your comment? Yeah, I would definitely echo both the earlier panelists' uh, sentiments. Mm -hmm. Yes, let us in all of us inclusivity and diversity, and this being a public health professional, I would reiterate the earlier WHO approach of health for all and harm reduction for all. Okay, fair enough. I think everybody, pretty much I'm reading the comments and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I agree with all of you. And and if you can't do what everybody's saying, then you should do what Madhua said last night and just resign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Shri, I know you have things to do. Thank you for joining us, taking your time out. I know you're a busy lady. Thank you, Liana, and thank you, Asa. All of Very you are more obliged. busy than me. <laughs> nah. Thank, thank you, you for everybody. the opportunity. Thank you, Nancy, thanks. for all the work you've done. Thanks, Definitely. Liana. Thanks, yes. thanks audience. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. All.